Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Wednesday, and thank you so much for joining us for another Wednesday afternoon webcast. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager at Barometer Capital, and today we will provide you with a brief macro overview and, of course, at the end of our conversation, address your questions. So please don't be shy. Hit me up on the question chat via Zoom or email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca. And joining me today, as always, David Burroughs, Chief Investment Strategist and President at Barometer Capital. And with that, I turn the conversation over to David Burroughs. Happy afternoon, David, and welcome to the month of May. Who would ever have guessed? Here we are <laughs> in May. We're still at home. Uh, and uh, well, I guess nobody really knows when we have a background like this, but let's just say we're at home. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it seems as though the vaccine is finally really flowing in Canada. Most of the people who I'm speaking to have had at least one shot. And certainly that that is uh, gives great effectiveness. And uh, the sooner we can get reopened, the better. Pam, uh, how are you doing where you are? We're great. We can't wait to come back up to Canada. We're based down here in South Florida and looking forward to seeing our family up in Toronto. So hopefully everything uh, will be all for the better this summer and uh, really looking forward to getting back at the office. Yeah, well, we look forward to seeing you in person. Certainly, we've been doing lots of Zoom calls with folks. And uh, today, what I thought I'd do is just quickly run through our key themes. Uh, you know, clearly the market is sensing the fact that we are getting closer to uh, reopening the economies in, in Canada, in the, in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, certainly people looking at the types of things that are going to benefit from a pickup in economic activity, and, and that is having an impact on the types of things that are working in the market. And so just uh, why don't we take a, a quick tour around through the asset classes uh, and then talk about some of the specific things that we're focused in. Uh, and, you know, what may be changing as we as we move along here. So, you know, we continue to be in this structural bull market that started in 2013 and in equities. The S&P was really the first of the major indices to kick things off. Uh, we have been going through, as we've talked about, what we believe is a secular bottoming in yields. Uh, and uh, that definitely changes the environment as to what works. People got very comfortable with the idea of falling interest rates uh, and, you uh, Certainly, many didn't think through what it might mean if they bought a 10-year bond that yielded them 50 basis points <clears throat> and rates started to rise. So certainly, bond yields going higher, bond prices going lower. And as we've talked about over the last number of months, it's, it's very clear at this point, we've gone through a significant long-term bottoming in commodity prices, uh, which when it happens is significant for the companies that produce them because, of course, the last marginal dollar of demand sets the price for everyone. So if there is short supply, prices go higher and profitability goes up. And certainly that's, that's a good thing to be a shareholder. Uh, equities continue to bump along the top end of the channel that they've been in since that correction last fall, September, October. And certainly, you know, quite amazing what's happened since the March bottom in equities uh, as to where things are today. Incredible what liquidity can do, incredible, how far ahead market participants look in making their decisions. It, it's something that really you have to remember. Uh, it's not about what's happening today, but what people think might happen nine months, 12 months from now. And certainly the market has been sniffing this uh, progress out over some time. NASDAQ certainly uh, you know, was very, very strong off the bottom. Interesting now since sort of uh, February, market has been chopping its way sideways. As we went into earnings, we said perhaps earnings could be good enough in the large cap technology stocks to reaccelerate them. But our view has been that because large cap growth stocks had been the only growth game in town, they were very crowded and it was very possible that we would see underperformance in those areas as money came from those stocks and those sectors into sectors that might have a much more substantial increase in profitability as the business cycle gets going. So that has been the case. Uh, we continue to be in a world where we're in falling bond prices and we've seen bond prices consolidate over the last five, six weeks. Uh, it certainly was a very sharp move down in prices into the uh, middle of March. 
and that probably got overdone rallying back up into sort of the moving averages. Um, however, you know, I think it, it's, it's clear that it is likely that rates are likely to resume their move higher and bond prices lower. Certainly the point and figure charts tell a very clear story. We broke long-term trend in bond prices in what has been the most significant sell-off in fixed income since the bull market and bonds began in 1981, something certainly to sit up and take note of. Second, also important to recognize that even though bond yields consolidated in the US and maybe, maybe pulled back a bit in other parts of the world where maybe the reopening is happening, you know, fairly quickly or where people are sniffing out more economic growth, bond yields are not pulling back. In fact, staying very strong. And in, in probably what I think is the biggest tell is while bond, bond yields moderated over the last six weeks, the thing that would indicate strong economic activity and higher prices, the ratio between copper and gold has blasted off to the upside, meaning that copper continues to be very strong. And you know, there's a reason why people have called copper Dr. Copper. Dr. Copper sniffs out uh, uh, rollovers in the business cycle and accelerations in the business cycle. And certainly uh, the, the world believes that, uh, that copper is gonna be in short supply. When we look at some of the economic data that we've seen over the last week, really important to recognize this yellow line, which is prices paid in the economy relative to new orders. So certainly the market is sniffing out uh, that demand is gonna push prices higher. Okay, so let's talk about commodities. Commodities, we've talked about the fact that over the last little while, we broke out of a multi-year bear market, 10-year bear market. We've had four or five months while the market has been working its way higher. Different commodities broke out at different points in time, but certainly as a whole, this is the Rogers Commodities Index, which is an equally weighted index of various commodities of all types. Uh, some of them actively traded, some just sold in the spot market, but you can see we have seen a steady march higher since last summer. And that has continued over the last week and certainly over the last few weeks after consolidating a little bit in March. So let's talk a little bit about some of the data, of course, Right now, it's all about earnings. Uh, we're a long way through earnings. We're about, about halfway through earnings. The average company has beaten the estimates on revenue by about 3.7%. Uh, that's great. Uh, earnings have beaten on average by 23%. Of course, revenue and earnings were expected to be higher because we're comparing against a very difficult period last year. But what is important is how companies are doing relative to what the estimate was because analysts tend to be a little bit careful as the economy picks up. They don't want to overestimate, uh, but certainly companies are beating. We're, we're very proud of, of our analysts. They've been working very, very hard and sort of staying on top of uh, uh, the specific securities that we're focused in. Our goal always is to find securities that are good getting better. So we're rarely looking for turnarounds. We're also always looking for companies where it looks to us like things are getting better faster than what people expect. And when we look at sort of the results we've seen so far, uh, we're seeing that. Uh, for the average company in the S&P, revenue growth has been about 11%. Earnings growth has been about 50%. Um, when we look at uh, the, uh, rev the uh, revenue growth for uh, our companies, we've had slightly higher revenue growth than the S&P but much greater earnings leverage. And that speaks to the fact that we are in more cyclical securities. And we think analysts are underestimating the impact that this reacceleration can have on cyclical companies' earnings. Our companies have beaten their earnings estimate on average by almost 90%. So with 42 out of 59 of our US holdings reported, we've seen just great results. Uh, and we're seeing that flow through into share price. Consumer confidence, as we've talked about uh, over the last little while, continues to rise. So certainly the consumer's in good shape and a combination of lots of liquidity and some optimism is a pretty powerful combination. So let's talk about the theme, see if anything's changed. Of course, 
we've talked for some time about the fact that value-oriented securities, in this case, that means more cyclical securities, because those are the ones that had been out of favor, were more reasonably priced, uh, certainly have reestablished themselves as leadership after a hesitation at quarter end where we saw some rebalancing. So this is important because, of course, when you see things hesitate and consolidate, you want to see them reaccelerate to make the next leg higher. And that certainly appears to be the case. In the case of financials, and this, of course, is insurance companies, uh, large money center banks, uh, regional banks, uh, some financial technologies, and certainly insurance of various types. The composite of the group, the XLF index, took out the highs from 2008, about four months ago, and since then have been sort of on a tear across various groups. But when we look at some of our holdings, we're really pleased. Silicon Valley Bank Corp, which is one of our biggest bank holdings, uh, banks, of course, in Silicon Valley and in, in Texas uh, uh, had uh, loan growth way in excess of industry uh, loan growth, something like 13% loan growth. Uh, profits came in well ahead of expectation and the market responded, stocks trading to new highs. First Republic of San Francisco, again, in California, in the area where there is lots of innovation taking place, loan growth of just over 22%. And again, well ahead of estimate, stock is responding on to new highs. Back here at home, we have both Manual Life and Great West, both responding quite well to better markets uh, and higher rates, good for insurance companies. Okay, industrials. Now, and this is a big group. It includes aerospace, it includes transportation, it includes uh, heavy equipment. Uh, and certainly this group is performing well. What I love to see in anything that we own is a very steady, tight, orderly progression higher. That is a sign of great supply demand dynamics in the shares. When things get volatile, it means there's a breakdown taking place between the buyers and the sellers. When things, as they say, get loose and wide, that is absolutely not the case in the industrials. They are slowly marching their way higher. Certainly the transports are one group that we really like. We've talked about the rails. CN pulled back over the last week or so on this discussion around Kansas City Southern, but the truckers and the logistics companies acting really well. We've talked about XBO before, FedEx making new highs, XBO, you know, churning higher over the course of the past week, the transport's really acting well. In the case of heavy equipment, we own both Deer and Caterpillar. Uh, also, both of them coming out of consolidations to the upside. When we see long periods of several weeks where the shares make no progress, but stay in a tight range, in most cases, if things are going well, we break out to the upside and that signals the beginning of another leg higher for the stock. Let's talk about commodities for a moment, because this is a really important area. If for us, it's a large weight in the portfolios. The, the global miners, and that includes the base metals producers like nickel and copper and, and zinc uh, and iron ore, performing quite well. Actually, gold and silver over the past couple of weeks certainly acting better also, but the composite, the PICK ETF, closed today at a new high. Now, that's fueled by things like higher copper prices, uh, higher iron ore prices, certainly steel uh, as a, as a, as a uh, byproduct, really doing well. Stelco had a tremendous day today. We own Stelco. We have have um, a little bit of Cleveland Cliffs as well. Now, the traditional uses for basic materials, of course, are reaccelerating. You know, building and construction, uh, auto demand, uh, heavy equipment, and so on. Infrastructure certainly will be a help to this group as well as their basic building blocks. But something we think are, is maybe underappreciated is the increase in demand for basic materials in a world where battery power is going to be the standard. So for instance, the use of nickel in batteries between 2019 and 2030 is likely to go up by 14 times, aluminum 14 times, phosphorus 13 times, iron 13 times, copper 10 times. So if we're looking for things that benefit from the electrification of the world, 
these groups all benefit. And certainly, again, the last marginal dollar of demand sets the price for the world. Share prices in, in these cyclicals can go fair ways higher. Freeport today closing at a new high. And if we take the lens back a little bit further, we've just taken out the highs from 2014 and 16, which again opens the door to another measurement higher. Freeport, the second largest producer of copper in the world and the big producer of gold as well. Uh, uh, first uh, quantum, oh, sorry, that's a, the, um, the uh, warehouser in the forest products continuing to work higher. We all know that lumber prices have worked their way higher over the last year. Some areas lumber prices tripling. Uh, they continue to move higher again, big leverage for these companies and earnings. Uh, in agriculture, we've talked a little bit about Nutrien and Nutrien uh, uh, is supplier of fertilizer and other agricultural products. Again, closing at a new high today. So this group really contributing over the last couple of weeks, having a big impact on things like our macro portfolio, which is now up just about 32% on the year. Uh, energy. Now we talked about energy about three weeks ago. We talked about the fact that energy had run into a downtrend line that had been in place since 2014. And that it might be that it had to do some more work, but likely would take another run at getting through that trend line. Today looks like it passed through. We'll see whether we can stay through, but certainly it's been a better week for companies in that space. We have Canadian Natural Resources which is just taking out some multi-year highs uh, and tourmaline energy, which is probably about the highest quality gas play in, uh, in Canada, really well managed, lots of opportunities going forward uh, and uh, certainly behaving much better than the group. Arc Resources, another one of our Canadian holdings, big in liquids. Liquids, of course, are used to dilute bitumen and move them through the pipelines. Prices are moving higher there uh, and again, this group has just come out of a consolidation and, and looks like it's headed higher. So energy could be quite important for the Canadian market. And as we talk about, it also tends to have an impact on the Canadian dollar. And so we continue to have all of our portfolios that are pooled or, or, or funded uh, hedged back to Canadian dollars, not wanting to take currency risk against a rising Canadian dollar. Consumer. Consumer discretionary sector, again, at new highs today, uh, continuing to work its way higher, led by the home building sector and companies that supply the home builders. We've talked about the fact that, again, this is a group that's come out of a range that dates back to 2006. Again, ending a long bear market, beginning a new bull market. And always there are companies within these groups that have fared better than the rest. And in the home builders, we've talked a little bit about Century Communities, which is one of our larger holdings. They absolutely blew the doors off earnings this week, coming in well over 100% above estimate uh, and a very large increase in their order book and homes delivered, much, much well above what was expected. And then some of the companies selling into the home builders and the, and the home improvement market, PPG and Sherwin-Williams, both in the paint area, again, really moving higher over the last few weeks and making a great contribution. So uh, we're, we're, we're pretty happy with where things are going. In the income portfolio, dividend growth theme continues to strengthen versus the S&P 500. That is probably being fueled by investors taking money from, say, fixed income or high dividend paying stocks that has very little economic sensitivity and moving into companies that are likely to have dividend growth in excess of the rate of increase in interest rates. And this can help you offset the impact of inflation and rising rates. So dividend growth is a theme performing well. This is the RDVY in ETF. I've been putting it up now for several weeks to highlight the fact, again, nice, tight, steady advance in this group. We're seeing this in our underlying positions and we're certainly seeing dividend increases. We, when we look at where we are, and this is a bit from about a third of the way through the earnings period or a few days ago, uh, so far as we've gone through second quarter, uh, as we're going through second quarter, we've had 33 companies increase their dividend versus last year's second quarter, 36 for the entire quarter. And when we look at it, there were 31 companies that suspended their dividend, 
19 companies that decreased their dividend. We've seen none of that. And so certainly dividend growth is going in the right direction and that's being perceived by the market as something that's positive. So now let's talk about tech. Uh, we talked last week about the fact that tech had been underperforming. The stocks rallied toward the earnings period. And one of the things we have to keep in mind is that tech companies largely garner many of their, much of their gains on their earnings reports. So in the event that they beat, as we've moved along, we've seen companies have large jumps in their share price on their earnings report. Now I have to say it was a very interesting week last week because despite some of the best earnings I've ever seen in companies like Amazon that close to tripled the estimate, uh, the response was somewhat underwhelming. So here we are a week later, the NASDAQ is having trouble making progress. As you know, as we went through uh, March, we reduced our weight pretty significantly in technology yet to come back. And it was not a very uh, appetizing result for technology. So as a result, we've continued to reduce our weight here. Large cap tech appears to be for sale. But I think what was most interesting this week is that yesterday on a 3% decline in the NASDAQ by 11 o'clock, most sectors followed lower to begin with, but by 11 or 11.30, the financials were rallying, the industrials were rallying, the basic materials were rallying, and all three groups wound up up on a day where the NASDAQ had been down close to 3%. So that tells us not that there's weakness out there, but there is very significant rotation taking place and that these large cap tech stocks in general are for sale, whether that is that it's just some rebalancing taking place or whether it is that people are looking in other, other places for new ideas. It's just something that's important to recognize because these groups certainly are well loved. Semiconductors would be a large part of that and semiconductors have been underperforming since the end of February we now have virtually a zero weight or very close to it in semiconductors. And we watch whether in fact they can hold these long-term moving averages and maybe firm up. But at this point, given the fact that there's lots to do in financials, lots to do in consumer discretionary, lots to do in basic materials, this is a battle that we don't have to fight. We like to sell strength, sell weakness and buy strength. And there's lots of strength that we can focus in. The few companies that we do have have held in quite well. Google generated a great earnings report. Stock certainly has come off a little bit, but fractionally since the earnings report uh, is hanging in pretty well so far. Facebook, another, and Microsoft, another. Groups we don't own. Consumer staples continue to relatively underperform. Utilities continue to underperform. These are groups that we're not focused on. And now when we bring in what's going on in, in tech, tech actually made a relative strength, new low versus the market for the first time in several years. In other words, it is underperforming the market enough that it is now at a 52 week low relative to what the market is doing. So quickly on flows, lots of liquidity getting put into the system that doesn't appear to be stopping anytime soon. Corporations continue to have very significant cash weights. They are growing as we're going through the earnings period. We're getting lots of buybacks announced and the buyback machine has restarted for many of the companies that have already reported and can be back to buying back their shares. The buybacks are accelerating. So liquidity is good. Uh, flows coming from corporations is good. Uh, and certainly investors have lots of liquidity in savings. So a few things that we watch beyond our breadth models, we watch volatility, of course. Volatility remains muted. We watch credit spreads, credit spreads, continue to point to the idea that corporate bond investors are not overly concerned about credit risk. The spreads are very low. And when we walk through our process, trying to focus on identifying leadership, targeting those areas, looking for change, and if there is weakness, making an exit. The one thing I can say is that we have moved away from tech in large part, and we are extremely focused in those three core leadership groups, uh, financials, industrials and basic materials, certainly energy fitting in there as well. From a indicator perspective, 
our breadth model for the U.S. continues to be positive, meaning that more and more companies are participating in the rally. The same picture is the case for the world, uh, world uh, equities, global equities as a whole. Uh, for the most part, our short-term indicators are positive. Percent of stocks with positive weekly momentum or upward trajectory is rising again, meaning that's a broadening market. Uh, lots of companies making new highs versus a small number of companies making new lows. And about 95% of companies trading above their 150-day moving average or long-term trend, which means we're in a bull market. So we watch every day for signs of deterioration. We are very cautious at the sector level to make sure that our holdings are in groups that people care about and that are making forward progress. We look very little like the overall index itself. Uh, and when new themes emerge, as they have over the last number of months, these things can go on for a very long time. From a weightings perspective, our weighting in financials continues to expand, as I said, across regional banks, large money center banks, insurance companies, some fintech. 36% of the firm's assets are in financial assets, arguably still probably the most under-owned part of the market. Industrials make up 14% of the firm's weights. Technology now down to 6.9% as of yesterday. Materials at about 10%, three times the benchmark weight. Energy close to 10%, again, three times the benchmark weight. So we're very focused. Um, if we were to see things start to change, and they can at any time, we can certainly pull back on the throttle. But right now we're in a constructive environment. We're trying to take advantage of it. And realistically, in a world where inflation is picking up, sitting in cash or sitting in fixed income is not gonna do it. So um, we're moving forward. We're gonna continue to do these calls weekly. We've had lots and lots of good feedback on them. And if you've got suggestions as to what we might do to make them better, we'd love to hear them. But with that, Pam, if there's any questions, certainly we can answer them. Yes, of course. Thanks so much, Dave. So the first question uh, comes from Stephen in Toronto. He wants to know how the equity pool has performed as of late and if it is well positioned to recover the ground lost in early Q1 2021. Sure. So um, the portfolio actually performed very well through January and February. But the equity portfolio of all the equity pool of all of our portfolios had the highest concentration of mid-sized technology companies. And certainly that was a group that rolled over in March and that had a negative impact in the month of, month of March. Also, of course, the other key themes, which we just talked about, uh, materials uh, and financials, uh, and industrials all pulled back in the month of March, but have since reaccelerated. So we did give up some ground in March. In, uh, in April and now in May, the holdings and materials and financials are making a big difference and the portfolio is, portfolio is lifting. Um, you know, the reason we use a number of different pools or in a separately managed account, a number of different sector weights is because, you know, there are going to be groups that run out of gas and roll over. Uh, so while the equity portfolio had a weaker month in the month of March, you know, the macro portfolio is up, I don't know, 32% so far in the year. Uh, and the income portfolio and balance are chugging along. What I can say is that when, when cyclical stocks or reflationary themes kick in, it's not going to be for six months. It is likely to be for many, many years. So the fact that we're, we saw a pullback in the month of March and some of those themes is not a big deal. And as you can see from the discussion today, each of them have reaccelerated and are now making new highs. So, uh, you know, certainly mid cap technology had a bigger impact in the equity portfolio, but that's where you would expect it to be. And when the market changes gears, as we've talked about, we change our positioning and drive forward in, in, in what appears to be the existing leadership and those three key groups appear to be the case. Thanks so much, Dave. A question that, well, I'm certainly fond of, gold, silver, and diamonds. Uh, <laughs> this question, <laughs> especially the diamonds, <laughs> but in order to hold those diamonds, you need good gold, Dave. Um, 
there's been a few stories that have hit uh, the press as of late. Um, so that this question is in two parts. So the world's largest jewelry manufacturer announced that they are discontinuing the use of new gold and silver and will in the future use only recycled gold and silver. They have also announced that they will use exclusively manufactured diamonds and will not be in the market for newly minted diamonds. The second part to this question is that there is another, there, there's lots of stories right now about digital currencies, cryptocurrencies um, competing with the price of gold and how they are keeping the price of gold down. So the question to you, David, um, is if you could comment on the effects of either of or both of these elements and um, what you think the effects will be on future markets for these commodities. I know we touched a little bit on commodities earlier, but if you could uh, comment, I'm sure that would be greatly appreciated. Absolutely. Thank you. A long-winded question, but a good one. Well, it's a, that's a, it's a fair question. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. You know, sometimes things in the market take longer to happen than what you would expect or that, you know, seem, seems like it takes a long time. This is the long-term price of gold. Now, the first thing I want to say is you're always trying to understand why things are happening, but the most important thing is what is happening. And so, you know, whether we're talking about energy or whether we're talking about gold or other kinds of basic materials, um, you know, there are going to be some investors who don't want to be involved, you know, in a world where ESG has become a big issue, it has changed the appetite in different areas or different institutions for different industries to invest in. So everyone has to make their own decisions. Um, but uh, when I look at what's going on in, in gold, gold certainly consolidated over a long period of time, ran into last August, and then the price is consolidated. Now we always care about what's happening in the stocks versus the gold itself. And we've talked over the last few months about the fact that gold was consolidating pulled back into the point where it broke out, at some point it was likely to reaccelerate. And we always want to watch for what's happening in the leading stocks. So if we were to take Newmont as an example of a leading company, Newmont recently, after being in that consolidation channel, broke out to the upside. So look, demand comes from many, many different places and certainly you know, people buying rings if they decide they don't want to buy new, newly minted gold as opposed to as opposed to recycled gold. Well, that maybe reduces the, the demand in some way, but there's lots of uses, uses for gold. All I would say is that the composite of all the things going on in the market have the gold producers starting to break out of this consolidation channel, which to me means we've begun the next leg higher. If we were to look at Franco Nevada, it looks quite similar, right? It's moved out of this channel and now chugging higher. And so we always look at what are the first companies to break out of a range. We own Franco Nevada, we own some Newmont, uh, but certainly it's happening in lots of areas. If we take the junior gold miners, you know, it's just broken out of that range and consolidating, we're seeing indicators turn positive. So uh, I, I'm not sure that I can pin this to any one thing, but certainly there is inflation. There's reason why people would want to buy gold, uh, juniors and silvers. We want it. We want. We also see that uh, we're seeing um, uh, the silver stocks again consolidate in a range and look like they're getting ready to, to come out of that several year range. But we'll see. Uh, we have small weightings there, and as they get better, we increase our weightings. I can't comment on diamonds because I'm not focused on it, um, but that's, that's sort of where we are in gold. Now, there's no question that the cryptocurrencies probably are stealing some attention. And, you know, certainly we have been there ourselves. I think that people raised some eyebrows when we bought Bitcoin last year uh, in our macro portfolio at about $11,000. It rallied to 64,000. As it put, turned lower recently, we reduced our weight and moved away. But we had moved already into Ether. And Ether has been a different story. It's absolutely been a, 
been a, a giant over the last few weeks. And so I do think the cryptocurrency is taking the place in some ways for uh, gold and silver. And as I've said before, these things each have small positions in portfolios and they have a place to play. And in our case, uh, we own a little bit of cryptocurrency. Macro, I think, has a total of about 7%, uh, which is contributing. Uh, we also have a position in gold and silver producers, but that's alongside of, of base metals producers, agriculture companies, uh, uh, U.S. corporations and industrials and consumer. You know, they are their position players and they will grow if they perform well. If they don't, they'll become smaller pieces of the portfolio. Well, that's great. Thanks so much, Dave. I appreciate your comments and so do all of our viewers. Uh, with that, we don't have any further questions. The, the weather must be getting nicer in Toronto, um, or hopefully it is. Hopefully and, uh, <laughs> um, and hopefully soon. So I leave you with the final word and thank you so much. We've been doing these calls uh, for over a year now. Um, one of my colleagues, Lori Ouellette, had this great idea to have us uh, on these weekly calls. And it's been a wonderful addition to how we communicate with our investors. So thank you for, for doing this with us. Well, look, I think, I think that we will probably never stop doing these weekly calls. And whether people join weekly or once every few weeks or once, once every few months, we're happy to have people on. Uh, obviously, you know, we're in the business of using the process that we have to try and build portfolios that are relevant right now. And uh, if, uh, if there are people who would like to have a, a, a longer conversation about that, whether we're talking about separately managed accounts or whether we're talking about pools or whether we're talking just uh, you know for information purposes, certainly always happy to have those conversations. It's been great though, as we've been doing reviews with clients, the fact that many of them have been watching these weekly calls and feel fairly versed in what our thinking is and where we are. And it allows us to have some sort of more personal conversations on what's going on in their lives. So, so we really appreciate that. Um, so with that, let's, let's sign off and, and uh, we look forward to seeing everybody again next week. If something happens that is dramatic in the meantime, we'll certainly uh, be out with information on it, but uh, uh, right now it kind of looks like steady as she goes. Thanks so much, Dave. Thanks everyone for joining us.